going to start a series looking at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, both for the body of Christ as well as for the nation of Israel. A lot of times when you talk to Christ, Christendom or Christians, you know, people in Christendom, when you talk about the Lord's coming, they confuse the matter. They've been confused. They, 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 they combine the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ for the body of Christ with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ for the nation of Israel. But that topic, like every topic, the coming of the Lord has to be rightly divided. We're going to first look at the coming of the Lord for us, the body of Christ, and then also for the nation of Israel in, this, in these Wednesday night studies. If you look with me and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to start at verse 1, and we'll, we'll read down a few verses just to get a, a, a sense of what's going on. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, through the will... I got, let me say that again. I got, the, I got Romans chapter 1, verse 1 on my mind, because I, I, I do that every week on the radio. Here we go. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Verse 7, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, stop right there just to kind of show you what's going on. We all know about the carnal Corinthians. They were saints and uh, they had a struggle allowing Paul to be their apostle. They had a, a struggle with acknowledging, as we saw in our second Corinthians study last Sunday, acknowledging Paul, in, in they, they did in part but not fully. They, they always questioned his authority. But even though they questioned his authority, he still reminded them that he's their apostle as well as they are in Christ. Look at the first verse. It says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. Paul starts that way. He wants to remind them right off the bat, right off the bat that he is the sent one of Jesus Christ, and it was God the Father's will that Paul be that apostle. Uh, Sosthenes, as we learned over in the book of Acts, Sosthenes was a ruler of a synagogue in the book of Acts. He was a Jew, an unbelieving Jew at first, and uh, he got beat down at the judgment seat. And, 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 and what I believe is that right after that, the Apostle Paul, who was there, was able to heal him, number one, take care of his wounds, Paul could do that, but also teach him about the Messiah, Jesus. And Sosthenes, who was a leader of the synagogue, ends up being a grace-believing brother. He got saved into the body of Christ. Verse number, verse number two, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, that's from the book of Acts. We know that from Acts 17, 18. That time, he, as he leaves Thessalonica and goes to Corinth, he says, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Notice that positional sanctification. We talk about sanctification as the secondary thing after uh, justification, and it is. It's a process of sanctification. But there is a positional sanctification, too. When you're in Christ, you're sanctified. You're set apart unto God. Now, the Corinthians weren't serving God much. They were carnal, they were babes in Christ, Paul couldn't give them a lot, but they still, because they were in Christ, saved by God's grace, they were sanctified. And notice it's Christ Jesus. Uh, based upon the cross work, his suffering, they can have that privilege and honor of being in Christ. Note, notice what he says, called to be saints. Now that's their walk. Now that they're in Christ and sanctified, God wants to sanctify them. He wants to sanctify them practically, their practice. That's what a saint means. When we call ourselves saints, it's not just who we are in Christ. God desires us to be, have Christ formed in us, as he tells the Galatians. With all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Now, this was an interesting time because the little flock of Israel was still around. As late as 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks about those 500 Jewish brethren who saw Jesus Christ our Lord rise from the dead. Many of them were still alive. Well, that, that uh, both theirs and ours, the little flock, as well as the body of Christ, we both share the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, there's no little flock today. They died off. But during the transition period, 
of the book of Acts where Corinthians was um, written, the, the little flock was still on the scene. And Paul says, both theirs and ours. Uh, Brother Toby asked me about on, on Sunday about Galatia. And because that was the first book Paul wrote, um, there were Jews who were members of the little flock at Galatia. Peter himself writes those Jews. But they weren't members of the body of Christ. They were members of the little flock, okay? Just know that during the transition, you got two groups of people who are of the household of God. You got the heavenly uh, household of God, the body, and you have the earthly household of God, the little flock. That's why he says both theirs, that's the little flock, and ours, the, the, the body of Christ. Verse 3, Paul's official announcement of grace unto you, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. That's God's official proclamation today. God is not put sending out judgment and war. He's being gracious and offering peace through the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number four, I thank my God always on your behalf. Paul prays on their behalf. As, as, as their spiritual father, chapter four, he was in a position where he could pray on their behalf unto Almighty God, as you can do for your own child. Verse number four, I thank my God always on your behalf. Notice, for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. Paul's going to constantly remind them that they are under the grace of God. That no matter what they do in their carnality, they still belong to God by his grace. Verse number 5, that in everything you are enriched by him, God blessed them, the riches of his grace. Notice, and he's going to talk about these spiritual gifts in all utterance and in all knowledge. Chapter 12, 13, and 14 talks about all these gifts. Verse number 6, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. When you looked at this Corinthian church, you had, they had all the gifts of the Spirit, chapter 12, 13, 14, operating, okay? It was, it was clear that they were God's people. Verse 7, so that ye come behind in no gift, even though they were carnal, and those gifts were for, for the infancy of the body of Christ, they had every gift. They could come behind no gift. But here's the part I want you to see, verse 7. Waiting, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that Paul puts the focus on waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ultimately, the, the, the life of a believer has an end goal, and that is to be prepared for the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, the radio program, our dear brother King David, he, he sings 10 minutes in the Word, that's the name of the program. He says, to prepare you for the judgment seat of Christ. That's what our job is. And that's what, that's what he means. Look at verse 7. Waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're waiting for him to come. We're to, we're to be looking for that. Okay, We're going to talk about looking for that blessed hope and so forth in a minute. But we're to be waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God wants us to feel that, in, that um, what's the word I'm looking for? Em, eminency. It's eminent, right? Eminency. He wants us to walk as if the Lord's going to return at any moment. He wants us to do that. How, why do we do that? Because it, it, it will affect our walk. Now, this coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is not just to deliver us from the wrath to come. We're going to see that it, that's one of the reasons. But the main reason that he's coming is to take us to the, the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, That's the key when we talk about his coming. It's not just delivering us from this Christ-rejecting world, which is what we want him to do. The main reason he's coming is to take us to judgment seat of Christ and ultimately to put places in heavenly places. Let's look at some more verses about this. Uh, this issue of the coming of Lord Jesus Christ, Paul always used that to motivate those saints. Go to chapter 4, if you will. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. <laughs> the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice what Paul says. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5. He says, therefore judge nothing before the time. Now in context, they were, they were trying to sit in judgment about Paul and who he was. And he says, I'm not worried about your judgment about me. Paul says, I don't even judge myself. I'm looking for the Lord to judge me. Notice what he says, verse 5. Therefore judge nothing before the time. And, and watch that next part of that sentence, until the Lord come. Now, what, when, when, when he calls him the Lord, remember, the Lord means the righteous judge. That's right, the righteous judge. 
when I saw that a few years back, that every time I see Paul talks about the Lord, it's in context of the judgment seat, him being the judge. He, said, he says in 2 Timothy 4, the Lord, the righteous judge. It just hit me one day, and I said, it just opened up the word for me. When he says the Lord, the, that means the righteous judge. When he talks about Christ Jesus, focus on his suffering, then his glory. So here, Paul definitely is talking about the judgment seat. Look at verse 5 again. Therefore, judge nothing before the time. There's a time schedule for our, for our, for our sojourn here. Until the Lord comes. Now, what is he going to do? Look, look what Paul focuses on. Paul's focus here is not that he's going to deliver us from this Christ-rejecting world, save us from the wrath to come. He's going to do all of that. But notice the focus here. Who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness. God's going to put on display everything. That's a scary proposition. He's going to put it all out there. You get away with nothing. Now, God's goal is to prepare you now for that judgment. He gives, you, he gives us space to repent and so forth. But he's going to bring to light things that are hidden in darkness. And, in addition to that, look at verse 5, and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. Do you know that God, he has that ability, he's going to make manifest your thinking process in your inner man on why you did what you did. He's going to look at your motivations that's amazing. Because sometimes people do things, but it's for the wrong reason, for the wrong motive. Not with God. The Lord Jesus is going to make manifest the counsels of the heart. What were you, what, what you were thinking about when you, when you did what you did. But at the end, notice this, because of God's grace. You know what Paul reminded about God's grace? And then shall every man have praise of God. God is going to tell some people who are going to be ashamed. They're not going to, they're not going to reign with Christ. They will see no reward, but the fact that they trusted Jesus Christ one day in their life, that's enough for God to say, well done, you trusted my son. And that's the grace of God. God will just give them that. But he wants us to have more than that. Go over to chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. When the Lord comes, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. I just want you to see that Paul constantly reminds these saints that the Lord's coming. The Lord's coming. Notice in the verse 26, as he speaks about how they should operate in their meals, their, 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 their charity meals. Verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread, that represents his life, and drink this cup, that represents his, his shed blood at Calvary. they got to remember what, what was going on at Calvary. Ye do show the Lord's death, notice, till he come. Constantly, Paul, our apostle, is reminding the saints that the Lord is coming. Now, um, we're going to go over to Jude real quick. Keep your hand, go to first, get 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to come back to chapter 15. I want to go over to the book of Jude because even though it's in prophecy, I want you to see that from the beginning of creation, from the beginning of man, this issue of the Lord's coming has been trumpeted and heralded throughout time. Um, mankind, every man should know that that day of judgment is coming. Because even from the beginning, let me show you something. Go to the book of Jude. It's only one chapter right before Revelation. It's the book right before Revelation. Look at Jude, verse 14. Jude, verse 14. Before we go back to 1 Corinthians, I want to let, let you see something. Notice what Jude said. He's a prophet to Israel. He's an he's a end, end time prophet. He's, 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 a, he's explaining what's going to happen, future from us, before the Lord's return. Notice verse 14. And Enoch also. Now this is Enoch way back in Genesis who walked with God. The seventh from Adam prophesied of these saying, Behold, now watch this. The Lord, the righteous judge, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. He says, now notice, even Enoch, way back in Genesis, God had mankind looking for the coming of the Lord. Now, the Lord did come. The Lord Jesus came for the first time, right? After 4,000 years of human history from Adam to Christ, he showed up. But we're going to see... When it comes to prophecy, 
He's going to come a second time. And who are those thousand saints? Well, there's going to be, he's, he's going to come with, with his, um, at the second coming, he's going to come with the Old Testament saints, Jody. She asked about those saints. But also with the, with the angels and so forth. But not with us. Not with us. We're going to be in the heavenly places at this time. I'm gonna when we go back to our 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 him coming for the body. This remember, needs to be made clear. Yes, we do, and I will make that clear. I need to, we don't say we need to make that clear. Yeah, this is the return of the Lord in prophecy. The body of Christ, we're gonna remain in the heavenly places. I'll get back to that in a minute. Jesus but, talking about the Jews. Right, he's talking. He's talking about how the Lord's gonna return to Israel and then set up His kingdom. The point of going here is I want you to see, look how far back it goes that the, the world's been looking for the coming of the Lord. Right. In his second coming, not just his first coming. Right. See, people think that, yeah, Jesus came, he was living, so, but what they don't realize, he rose from the dead, he's coming back. And Jude, way back in Genesis said, notice verse number 15, this is, he's on part of his wrath, to execute judgment upon all. Right. And to convince all that are ungodly among them mm -hmm. of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly, notice he keeps saying ungodly, ungodly. <laughs> which they have ungodly committed, and of their hard speeches. You know those proudful speeches against God? The hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back in wrath, according to prophecy, before he sets up his kingdom. So I want you to see something before we go back to 1 Corinthians. When it comes to the coming of the Lord for the body of Christ, that's, that's, the, that's the resurrection or the rapture. We're going to see. The heavenly kingdom. Right, to the heavenly kingdom. But first, the judgment seat of Christ, okay? okay? So the rapture, judgment seat of Christ, they go together. But when it comes to the coming of the Lord for Israel, in prophecy, we're going to see that it's the wrath. Okay. And the and the kingdom. That's right. It's the wrath and then the earthly kingdom. So I, if, 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 you, if you read the verses about the wrath, notice the kingdom's coming right with it. If you think about the kingdom, the wrath comes right before. When you think about the rapture, it's not just getting us out of this Christ-rejecting world. The judgment seat of Christ is the issue. Alright, go back to 1 Corinthians 15, if you will. 1 Corinthians 15. And verse number 23, constantly Paul is reminding these Corinthian saints. And I thought about it. Why would he constantly remind them of the Lord's coming? He's trying to motivate them to serve the Lord. Here he talks about the resurrection. Notice what it says in verse number 23. But every man in his own order. Well, uh, just for context. Let's get um, verse 21. First Corinthians 15, 21. For since by man came death. And what man was that? Adam. As by one man sin entered the world, Romans 5. That's Adam. Verse 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. What man was that? So the Lord, the man, Christ Jesus. That's right. Verse number 22. For as in Adam all die. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. You know how God sees the world today? He doesn't see Jew and Gentile, black, white, Hispanic, whatever. He sees in Adam and in Christ. That's it. Right. He sees lost people in Adam, saved people in Christ. Amen. That's how God sees the world. Yep. That's why he says in verse 22, two, for in Adam, that's the one who brought death, all die. All die. And also Physical death. Spiritual death, everything. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. And he's he's talking about our physical resurrection there. Notice. It's already been done. It's, it's already been done. People have to accept it. You have to trust it. Right. The, the word acknowledge we saw on Sunday means you have to receive that truth and acknowledge it. You've got to acknowledge it. Right. Right. Notice what he says here, verse 23. But every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, right? The Lord Jesus Christ is the first man to ever rise from the dead and never die again. Right. He's the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ when? At his coming. When do we, as members of the body of Christ, receive our physical bodies, our resurrected bodies, 
That's the rapture, or it's the resurrection, commonly called the rapture, but it's the resurrection. That's when we get our physical bodies. Do you know, even if you die before the Lord returns to come for the body, you don't get your body. A lot of times people think you die, you go to heaven, and then you get your body. No. You, well, we're going to see that. Everybody gets their body, their, their new bodies, their glorious bodies at the same time. We're going to see that in a moment. We're changed. We're, that's right. Yeah, let's look at it. We're right there. Right there. Look at uh, ch chapter 15, verse 50. Verse 50. Yeah, let's look at it. First Corinthians 15, verse 50. Now this I say, this, this is unique to the Apostle Paul, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Now, look at that. We are now flesh and blood. But like the Lord Jesus Christ's glorious body, his is flesh and bone. Flesh and bone. He tells that, he tells that to his disciples. A spirit has not flesh and bone, as you see me have. Think about that. Our, our, our glorious bodies, our resurrected body is going to have bones. So it's going to have all the components of our bodies now, except it's going to be no blood. Mm -hmm. Why the not blood? Been taken care of. You know why? Because blood, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Right. Well, who's going to be our life? Christ, the Spirit, the Spirit of God. That's right. Spirit. It cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now, by the way, when it says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, that's in the heavenly places. Because the earthly kingdom, everybody, well, most, most everybody is going to be flesh and blood. Right. It's going to be regular human beings. Okay. There will be some people with resurrected Except bodies. The saints that exactly. Come the ones coming are going to be resurrected. That's right, though. You got it. But he's talking about the heavenly places. Verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. This is part of the mystery of Christ right. given to Paul. We, we shall not all sleep. That's the way the Bible talks about physical death, right? Yeah. We're not going to all die. There's going to be a generation of believers, I hope it's ours, who won't taste physical death. We just we know what's going to happen. But we shall all be changed Amen. in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. That's the speed of light that just has light hits off your eye. It's that fast. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. Uh, by the way, uh, other versions change that to the last trumpet, but they mix that with Revelation. Revelation has seven trumpets. Yeah. It, this the, the word trump is the sound wave that when you blow a trumpet. Because look what it says, for the trumpet shall sound. It's to call them together. That's right, that's right. There's going to be, you're going to blow that trumpet. It said, for the trumpet shall sound. That's right. 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 And in the Bible throughout, trumpets represents gathering. Gathering. Mm -hmm. And then warfare. And that's what he's doing. Yeah. He's calling us to heaven. And he's declaring war on the earth. Because so once the Lord the takes us out, it's warfare coming on this earth, yeah? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so the trump, the, the trump is the sound wave, or the trumpet shall sound. Call us up. We're we called up. And the, now watch this. And the dead shall be raised incorruptible. So those, those, those are the saints who died before us. Mm -hmm. And we, the ones who are alive and remain, what? We'll we shall be changed. Amen. For this corruptible, mm -hmm. subject to death, so, I mean, uh, um, it's, it's, it's decaying, must put on incorruption. And this mortal, mortal means subject to death, mm -hmm. must put on immortality. Well, I just want you to see that that's what's going to go on at the resurrection rapture. But not everybody's going to die. And not everybody is, but in, not, not everybody's going to die. Some of us are going to be a, a, alive when he comes. But we all get our bodies at the same time. We're all changed. We're all changed. That's right. Um, go to 1 Thessalonians. Go to 1 Thessalonians, if you will. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Now when you read in the books of 1 and 2 Thessalonians, they have a theme like every book. The focus or the theme of 1 Thessalonians is the coming of the Lord for the body of Christ. For the body of Christ. Okay. The theme of 2 Thessalonians, it focuses on the coming of the Lord for the nation of Israel. Yep. The, prop, the prophetic, his, him coming back in prophecy, his second coming. The focus of 2 Thessalonians, let me say it like this, Doug. The focus of 1 Thessalonians is the rapture. Right, it's the coming of the Lord for us. Oh, okay, okay. What, what the Apostle Paul is laying out in 2 Thessalonians, though, because they were being confused. Okay. People were, conf you know how people today mix up the two comings? Right. 
Well, 2 Thessalonians was written to, to show them, make clear that, all, about, that the second coming is, and for prophecy is future. In other words, it's for the nation of Israel, it's for the earth, okay? Okay. That was, the, that was the reason Paul wrote it, to explain. That's chapter 2 of 2 yeah. Thessalonians. Right, he's saying, look, yeah. don't confuse his coming for us yeah. with his coming for Israel. That's what he's saying. And let me show you that. So 1 Thessalonians, the, the main focus is the coming of the Lord Jesus for the body of Christ. Let's look at it. Verse 9, chapter 1, verse 9. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. Jody said, what? <laughs> I had, I took it the opposite way. Oh, no, no, yeah. You, you know what Paul is doing in 2 Thessalonians? He's basically doing what I'm going to do in this study, in these, in this, these studies. He's going to talk about both comings. He's going to separate them. He's going to say, this is for us, but this is for Israel. He's going to separate, okay? Look at 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 9. Speaking of those saints at Thessalonians, he says, For they themselves show of us. What manner of entering in we had unto you. Okay? The Thessalonians believed Paul's doctrine so much that other people could see the word of God working in them. It got it only got back to the Apostle Paul. He was like, We didn't even have to say anything. Your, your faith was spoken of, like he says, to the Romans around the whole world. Verse 9. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. Now, the Thessalonians. Although it started in the Jewish synagogue, right? Paul went to synagogues, Acts 17. There were a lot of Gentiles in that, in that territory. Um, where's my map? Oh, I don't have my map. Let me sit this over here. Yeah. If you look at Macedonia and Achaia in your Bible, uh, your Bible map, you see Philippi, you see... Thessalonica and all that, okay? It's right in Greece. It's near Greece. So there were a lot of Gentiles in that area. They had Jewish synagogues there, but there were a lot of Gentiles. Okay? Macedonia. Macedonia. Now, the reason I bring that up is when you have a number of Gentiles in any area in that day, and even today, quite frankly, outside of America, you're going to have a lot of idol worship. Yeah. Yep. Catholic today, but that's that's tame. Catholicism is tame here in America. If you go to places like where Ryan is over in Asia, where they got these big temples and stuff, oh man, it's crazy. They 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 literally were going to worship these idols. Well, the Thessalonians used to do that. Look at verse nine, chapter one, verse nine. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from what. Idols. Now it's hard for us to imagine having a statue or statues and then worshiping. But old brother Fernando just on Sunday. He, he's because I was raised a cat. Yeah, he he, he grew up Roman cat. He said he would drive somewhere and it would be a big statue of Mary on the side of the road. He'd stop his car, get out with flowers and roses and everything, put it down to the. It's a statue. I'm, I'm assuming stone, and he'd go down and pray to it. This is before he came. Well, yeah, this is before he got <laughs> saved. Uh, he stopped doing it, yeah. <laughs> no, he was like, this is before. That's yeah. what they teach. That's what they teach. I right. wasn't here, I so I didn't know the concept. Yeah, yeah, he was, this is during the Q&A. And we were talking about how to deal with Catholics, right? He, he has a heart for Catholicism because he talks about, he's, 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 he says Latino Catholics. That's what his family is from Mexico. He said they, they're they beyond what normal Catholicism is here in America. Yeah. He said they literally pray. To, that, that's what we're talking about. They're praying to Mary like she's God, like a goddess. Yeah. And he said he was going back in his mind. He says I used. He said he used to go to Mary statues and, and bow down and pray to her. He him. was so zealous at that point. Yeah, so he had the right zeal, just the wrong one. Right. He said he would cry. <laughs> what, what did he say, Mark? He said he would cry. He said he would cry. He would be in tears weeping to Mary. Wow. He said he said to be a big Mary and then little Jesus, little baby. Do you see how 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 thrilled he is now to know the real? He knows the truth now. Right. He's a great believer. But but see, that's what he's talking about there. He said he turned to God from idols. idols. And by the way, Catholicism uses a lot of uh, idols and praying to saints and praying to Mary. 
That's all idolatry. Dead idols. <laughs> Dead idols, yeah. God is a, a living He's idol. A, you know what? Look at the rest of the verse. You turn to God from idols right. to serve the, the living, living and true God. That's who God, our Father is. Amen. He's the living God and He's the true God. Amen. There's no God above our God. But look at verse 10. As we serve the Lord as saints, what are we supposed to do? Verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus. Just so you'll know who that is. Nobody, let's make no mistake, even Jesus. Now notice this, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Amen. One of the blessings of his coming is he's delivering us from the wrath to come. We're not going through that tribulation period, the great tribulation and all that. Um, people wonder about the rapture. Is it free wrath? How can people Is it think it's mid trip? Yeah. How can they think that way? Because they don't that? know the Bible. They do hear not know the scripture. If Paul says he delivers from wrath to come, the rapture has to be before. Absolutely. So you can't be so mid trip or post trip as they go. It makes sense. Because he delivers. Hold the hand there. Go to Romans 5 real quick. Romans 5. Just to show you again, Romans 5. Right, they have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and the other Hebrew epistles, and they don't rightly divide. Really? They're, they're all over the place. That's Look right. at Romans chapter number 5. And verse number 8. And, uh, we're going to look at that, 8 through 10. But God commended his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. Right. He suffered on that cross for us. Now, if he died for us while we were yet still in our sins, mm -hmm. much more, verse 9, much more then, mm -hmm. being now justified, that's positional righteousness before God. Mm -hmm. We're now justified how? By his blood. Don't let those other versions take Colossians 1, 14, take the blood out. That's our position. That's it. We shall be saved from what? Right. Wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, if that was our state as enemies, much more being reconciled, that's our new position, we shall be saved by his life. That's saved from the wrath to come. Yeah, we don't we don't have to worry about going through that tribulation period. Let's look at some more of that. Go to go to First Thessalonians again. So Ron, Ron, sorry to cut you off. No problem. So, uh, people who don't rightly divide, they use they mix up wrath with hell, basically. Correct. Is that what they're, Correct. They're at? Okay. Yes. They don't know it's the wrath of the tribulation. Correct. The, the wrath the wrath to come is the one John the Baptist spoke about. He says, "You generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come?" That's the seventh seventieth weeks of Daniel, the seventh week of Daniel, the seven years of tribulation. That's the wrath to come, right? And what Mark is saying. Sometimes people mix the wrath with yes. being as hell. Yes. But no, the wrath to come is that time of tribulation on the earth. Right. We're not going through it. Look at chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians. Isn't that because they rejected Christ? Well, that's why Israel's going to go through it, yes. Yeah. And you can see the stage being set. Look at all the tar tar turmoil over in the Middle East right now. It's a mess over there. Is that little nation state Israel, and they got all these Muslim enemies around them who want to destroy them. They're going to be shooting rocks. rock. It's, it's going to get really bad. It's getting worse. It's going to get worse. Look at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. Paul is always looking forward to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what is our hope? That hope is always associated thinking about his reward, okay, that reign. Or joy, that word too. Or crown of rejoicing. See that word crown? I where you are. Oh, I'm sorry. First Thessalonians chapter 2, oh, though. Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter 2. <laughs> no problem. Means. <laughs> First Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 19. Got it. Got it. As Paul is looking forward to the coming of the Lord, he knows that the judgment seat of Christ is the issue there. Verse 19. For what is our hope or joy? These are associated with things that's going to uh, be, be manifested when he comes. 
or crown of rejoicing. Notice Paul recognizes that his work in these Thessalonians was fruit about to his account. Don't you remember you, 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 Chris and I were talking earlier, and you talking about how you, you have a heart to share the Lord Jesus Christ with others, tell people about it. And we were saying, it doesn't matter how they respond. The reward for you is, is getting them the information, planting the seed. It's something it's between them and God, whether they're going to believe or not. Paul understood, though, that his, his reward was tied up into saints, people. Watch this, verse 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? The R is a hymn, Timothy and Silas. Are not even ye... In the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, when? At his coming. Paul's going to look at them people and say, yes, they are our work in the Lord. Verse 20, for ye are, for ye are our glory and joy. Paul knew that his work in the Lord was not in vain. Now, were there people who began well and fell away? Yes. But Paul's not going to be blamed for that. He's still going to be rewarded for his work in their life. They're going to lose reward, but not him. But these Corinthians were, um, these Thessalonians were even better. They believe Paul's message, and, and they're going to reign with, with Paul in the heavenly places. He's, he's thinking about that already. Look at chapter number, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3, look at verse 13. Yeah. Just time after time. I was just looking at that. Oh, you did? Good. You read them? And what I want you to see, he's constantly talking about the coming of our Lord Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 3.13. To the end. Here's the, here's the goal and result of, of the Lord. Well, let's look at it. Verse 11. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 3.11. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Anytime he put that term Lord on there, remember he's thinking of the judgment seat. Direct our way unto you. Paul wanted to go and see him. And the Lord make you to increase and abound. Now notice, the righteous judge, he's going to say, use the judgment seat of Christ to, 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 to motivate you. To increase, that's in your, your uh, understanding. And what do you do with that increase in understanding? Abound in love, one toward another, right? We're by love, we serve one another. And toward all men. Look at that. We're going to love our grace brethren, our, our, our saint, our brethren in, in the body of Christ. But though you mentioned earlier how you, you felt kindness and compassion on the man, you don't know his, his situation. You don't know if he's saved or not. Most likely he's not. But you still have that love even for your fellow man, right? Mm -hmm. He says, toward all men, even as we do toward you. Mm -hmm. Now there's an end result, end goal here, verse 13. Why, that, why does he wants us to be motivated to serve the Lord? <clears throat> to the end, here's the result, the goal. He may, now remember that word establish. That's right. In, in, that, in that King James Bible, you have establish. That's more of the process from the outside in with man. That's a process. The term establish, or the word establish, to stabilize you, that's the end result, right? God is a God of process, but he has a goal in mind, okay? And what God wants to do is establish you, Romans 16, 25. Now look, let's look at this. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 3, 13. To the end he may establish your hearts, your inner man, unblameable. He's trying to do that now with the word. But because we, we have flesh and we have rebellion at times, the judgment seat of Christ is going to do that as well. But he doesn't want us to just get it done there. He wants to establish our hearts, now notice, unblameable in what? Holiness. Remember what we saw? Sanctification is unto holiness. He wants us to perfect holiness. 2 Corinthians 7. Holiness before God, even our Father. Now, remember, don't you asked earlier, when the Lord comes back in the second coming for Israel, right? Those saints, second coming for Israel, those are going to be the Old Testament saints. You said not the body. You're right. See, the body of Christ at the judgment seat of Christ, I think it'd probably be about But even Les Feltick thinks that it's, we're, we're coming with them. Well, he did up until 
a conference we did 10 years ago. Well, then I've been listening to one of his old oh, ones. <laughs> you know how I know this? He, we did a conference together, me, a couple other brothers, and Brother Les Felder in Minnesota. My study was seated in the heavenly places. Right. Les came up after the study, or we were sitting down or something. Remember this, there? I mean, he says, you know what, Ronnie? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was about 30 years old. He said, I always thought 31 years old. He said, we were coming back with Christ. That's what Les said. That's right. He says, but I learned something from your study. I, I see that we're going to stay in the heavenly places. I say, yeah. That old man said that to me. Are you doing you know, in Illinois at that conference? Remember that conference? Well, was that, was that when it was? Illinois okay. Illinois Oh, okay. Look, was Les there or was that in Minnesota? Yeah, he came. He came up on the stage. He was up on the stage. What year was that? Oh, I don't remember the year, but it was at the college. Now, we did one at her college. I thought that was the Minnesota one. Anyway. Is there a key verse about the staying in the heavenly places? Yeah, let me show you. I'll give you that in a minute. Ryan, maybe features too, okay, Mark? Let's finish this verse, though. You see this uh, at the end of verse 13? The Lord Jesus Christ's judgment seat is to make the body of Christ holy and without blame, without blemish before him in love. Notice, verse 13 again. To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before who? God. Before God. Listen, he's going to take us to God the Father. Well, before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his what? Saints. Listen. We go first to the judgment seat of Christ. Then the Lord Jesus takes us to God the Father. He's going to take the entire body of Christ after the judgment seat of Christ to God the Father. And that's where we, we stay, Mark. That's where in the third heaven. Uh, the third heaven. Who are we going to rule and reign in heaven? Well, there's the, you got the angelic. You got the angels. We're going to rule them. But also the heirs of God. The uh, the joint heirs are the ones going to reign, though. The joint heirs. Great question. Yeah. And I, I, I we'll talk more about this. The ones who get the crowns of righteousness and so forth, who suffer with Him, the joint heirs are going to reign. Reign. Then, but but remember, our our brethren, the other heirs of, of God, as well as the angels, are still going to be in the heavenly places. We're going to we're going to rule and reign over those that those are, people right there. Yep. That, that are not. That are ruling. right. The joint heirs are going to rule and reign over the heirs and the angels up there. Okay. Mark's question is about the heavens. Go to um, Ephesians two, Mark. Go back to Ephesians chapter two. We're going to look at Ephesians two. And we're going to look at. So we're going to, uh, we're going to look at uh, start Ephesians. Well, uh, start Ephesians one verse three. Let me start there just to show. One three. Yeah, look at Ephesians chapter one verse three. Okay. This sets the tone for the whole book. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual. Everybody get that? That's as opposed to the physical. All spiritual blessings where? In heavenly places in Christ. Notice the focus. Now go over, knowing that, Mark, go over to chapter 2 and verse number 4. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. Now here's the first mark. And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together, where? In heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. That issue of sitting together, Mark, made us sit together, that has to do with positions of authority. He, he, puts, he made us sit together in the heavenly places, in Christ. That's where we're destined to go. What's the position of sitting? Sitting, represent, or, or sitting represents um, a seat of authority. Okay. Like when the Lord Jesus Christ went into heaven, he says, he right said, hand exactly. hand. he said, come sit on my right hand so I make your enemies push through. It's kind of got that connotation to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A couple more. Um, go to Philippians chapter 3, and then we'll go to Colossians 3. Philippians chapter 3. 
When you're dealing with the body of Christ, you have to think heavenly places, heavenly places. I, I'm, I'm trying to do that, but yeah. I, I haven't got it yet. Totally. Yeah, yeah. It, it you just got it's, it's got to be a constant reminder because if you don't, you're just going to focus on this earth. I keep telling it to Charlene. Yeah. I just yeah. keep telling her we're we're citizens of heaven. Well, we're going to see that verse too, right here, right now. Look at Philippians, yeah. Philippians chapter three. Okay. Mm -hmm. Verse seventeen, Philippians three seventeen. My favorite book, my favorite chapter. Brethren, be followers together of me, Paul writes. And mark them, not you, Mark, but you one of these guys, mark them. Identify these men. And mark them which walk so as ye have us for an end sample. That's a sample of the body. And then sadly he has to write verse 18. For many walk, these are believers, they're in Christ, but they're not walking with the Lord. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping. Why was Paul weeping? Because there were saints who weren't walking in the truth. They were enemies. The there, there were enemies. That, look at it. That they are enemies of. Now, notice he didn't say the enemies of Christ. The cross of Christ. The cross of Christ. That's the message. That's what I said. Cross. Yeah. Because no believer is an enemy. No saved person. God doesn't look at any saved person as an enemy of his. He sees you as his child. But what, what he is is an enemy of the cross of Christ. That's the message of grace. Whose end is destruction, they're going to lose, they're going to be, that's that first Corinthians 3.17, they're going to they're gonna be saved, yet so it's by fire. They're going to burn up. They're, 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 they're worked. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. Belly is your carnal desires. Those are the things that, your, your carnal based desires. And whose glory is in their shame. The thing that they're going to be ashamed of the judgment seat of Christ, they actually glory in, which is wacky. But they're... They, they now here, the that's the shame. Yes. They glory in the earthly things. Who mind earthly things? Right. Their focus is on this present world, this earth. Right. Now, remember citizenship, look at verse 20. For our conversation is where? This is another verse, Mark. Our conversation is in heaven. That's our citizenship. That's what that, that's what that word is like, citizenship. Mm -hmm. From whence also we look for the Savior... And this is another verse on his coming, see? We look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is he going to do when he gets here? Who? Who shall change our vile body. You know our bodies are vile because of sin. Mm -hmm. That it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. We're going to get a glorious body like our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to do it in line with according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. His power is just going to take these vile bodies and change them. That this is his glorious power to change. He's, he subjects everything, even our own bodies. But notice our conversation is in the heavenly places, Mark. One more. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Oh, I love Colossians chapter number 3. If ye then, verse 1, if ye then be risen with Christ, and we are, right? That's a, that's a spiritual truth. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are what? Above. Which are? Well, notice, where Christ is on the right hand of God. Where is, where is the right hand of God today? In the third heaven, right? Where is Christ today? Well, what are the things? What are the things that we seek? Well, he's talking about all the things that he just wrote about in Colossians 1 and 2. Oh, okay. Okay? Okay. The, the doctrine, which is according to godliness. Seek those things. Okay. Don't even, when we serve the Lord here, it's fruit abounding to our account up there. He wants you to know that. Right. That, look at verse 2. That's what I'm, I'm looking at verse 2. Chapter 3, verse 2. Set your affection mm -hmm. on things above. These are things that could pertain to the heavenly kingdom, okay? So you, you're, 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 you're. What's the one to say? Um, you are storing up uh, fruit of, that is a balance to your account. That's what I'm going to say. With your souls. Yes. Well, it's everything. Uh, souls, it's, it's, your, it's any service you do for the Lord. Okay. Um, service. Your time, talent, treasure, as Paul all calls all three of those, fruit abound to your account. Okay. Now, if your time, talent, treasure ends up with souls being saved, that's fruit abound. But, but it's just your being a part of 
getting people saved and people edified. Mm -hmm. But notice which, where you put your affection. Mm -hmm. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. God doesn't want us to be earthly focused. That's the thing. That's hard. It is hard because look at this world. You, it don't mean you don't need to know the thing. You don't have you. You can't know what's going on. Just don't let that be where your heart is, your emotions, all these things, your affection. The things of this world are temporal. The th oh yeah, one more for Mark. Go to Second Corinthians chapter five, Mark. What'd you say there? Set your eyes upon Jesus. And look in his face. And look to his wonderful face. And the things of this earth grow, grow strangely dim in the light of his his, mar uh, his marvelous glory grace. And glory and grace. grace. If you focus on the Lord and the things that, that you, you want, he's trying to prepare you for the heavens, the things of this world go, go strange with them. Now, look at chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Oh, before we do, look at chapter 4, verse 16. Same content. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. For the which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, that's this one, right? Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. When you allow God's word to work, it's renewed day by day. Verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment. That's, that's what's going on now, right? Light affliction was for, but for a moment. Worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of what? What, what, what we suffer for Christ now and sacrifice from now, it works for our glory. Verse 18. Now this, this is why I came here, Cody. Mm -hmm. If you could see it, God says don't focus on that. Look, notice. While we look not at the things which are what? Seen. Mm -hmm. Don't focus on that. Why? Oh, but at the things which are not seen. Mm -hmm. That's in the heavens. For the things which are seen are what? Temporal. Temporal. They're temporary. But the things which are not seen are what? Eternal. They last forever. Seems like it's more souls than anything. Well. Because they're more lasting. It's souls, but you know what? It's hard to know what's. Because it's not just limited to souls. It's your service. Now your service affects souls, right? Mm -hmm. But it's whatever, it's, it's your time. See, I'm going to say this. Just your time, your prayers, so that's what I'm saying, it's, it's all the things you do to serve the Lord, right? Pray. For example, we got saints who are homebound because they, they're phys they physically cannot leave a home, right? They have physical infirmity. They said, Brother Ron, what can I do to serve the Lord? I can't even, you know, As leave. Charlene says. You can pray. Yes, she does. You can pray. When you pray for saints and pray for others, it's for the bounty of your account. That's true. You can give if you if you can afford. Like there are different things you can do. So that's what I'm saying. I don't want people to think they got to go out and just win souls. That's how that's how denominations pressure saints. Yes, they do. That's what they go. Oh, you might be the only Jesus. Is that? Yeah. So I don't want people to think unless they're out there winning souls, they're not serving the Lord. No, it's everything. It's, it's, it's what you're doing for Charlene. You minister to her, right? You take care of her. You, you take her to doctor's appointments. I've seen you. You go to the store for her. You do all these things for her. That's serving. Yeah, that's right. You share the word. That's what it is. Now, does it affect her soul? Yes. But I'm just saying, it's, it's all the things you do to serve the Lord. It's fruit bound to your account. Look at verse, chapter 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, that's this body, were dissolved. Now, Mark asks about the heavens, right? Notice, we have a building of God and house not made with hands. Now notice where it's at. Eternal where? In the heavens. Now watch this, Mark. It's eternal in the heavens. That means it's made for the heavens. That's why we, our bodies, our new bodies, our glorious bodies are made for the heavens. And that's where it's going to be. And then we'll, 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 I'll show you, we'll end in 2 Timothy 4 about the... We groaners? Yeah. Yes, we do. Well, yeah, the rest of the passage, I can get, get into 
We want those bodies now. Because these bodies hurt. <laughs> There's a day for that. Yeah. Because they these are the Bible. But but notice, I want you to see the focus. It's eternal in the heavens. That's where it's made for. Okay? Alright. Um come on. We got about five minutes. I got so many. Let's go back to uh First Thessalonians. You know what? Because it's so many verses in First Thessalonians, we'll just look at those. And then in two weeks. We'll start in 2 Thessalonians and then see the other verses in prophecy. We'll show that the second coming of the Lord for prophecy was prophesied in the Old Testament. We'll look at those. We'll go to 2 Thessalonians and then we'll look at some of the other passages. Let's uh, go to first. We'll end in 1 Thessalonians because there's a number of passages here. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians. Now, we just showed that the judgment seat of Christ is going to... Christ is going to be the thing where the Lord Jesus cleans up the body so that we can go before the Lord. We can't go before God the Father in an earthly body. With not only an earthly body, but our our souls and our souls have to be right. And what's going to happen is our inner man is going to be taken care of at that judgment seat of Christ. He's going to burn out all the drops, right? Then he can take us before God the Father. You see what I'm saying? That's that verse. Look at chapter 3, verse 13 again. To the end, he may establish your hearts. Why our hearts? He wants our inner man to be ready for the, for the Father. Okay, got it? Unblameable in what? Holiness. What's holiness? Set apart unto God. Before God, even our Father. At the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Once the body of Christ is reunited, the rapture. Once we all go for, to the judgment of Christ, that last person saved all the way back to Paul. The first shall be last. Paul was the first member of the body of Christ. He's going to be last, so he can get the crescendo. The last person saved that before the rapture, he'll be the first person judged. The first shall be last. So it's going to start with that. It's going to go back in time, all the way back to the apostle Paul. Once he gets his reward, his reign, we're all going to go right up to God the Father. You ever notice? I'm going to show you all. He says we meet the Lord in the air. He didn't say we go to the heavens. He didn't, he didn't say we go to the third heaven. So evidently, there's a place. He says we'll always be with him. Right, well, that's what's going to happen. But he's going to go to, we're going to be judged first, is my point. And then we go to the Father. I'm going to show you that. Look at chapter number uh, 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4. <coughs> I always wonder why he says the Lord in the air. And because when Paul wants to say third heaven, he'll say third heaven. He said it in 2 Thessalonians, 2 Corinthians. Well, well, evidently, this is like a place where he just does the judging. Or the changing. <laughs> well, he, he, it's, 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 a, it's a designated place for him to judge the body. And then he takes us to the Father. Okay. Watch this. It's somewhere in the air. And he says that same word to describe where Satan's at. The prince of the power of the air. So we're going to be right in Satan's domain, and he's going to be sticking it to him, is what he's going to do. Watch this. Verse number 13. Chapter 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. So these are saints who died before the rapture. That ye sorrow not, either, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we do, don't we? For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. This is his coming to, 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 to get us. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. When he says, Lord, think about the judgment. Righteous judgment. Like righteous judgment. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall... Dis by the way, he keeps... He, he called him Jesus... But when he calls him Lord, Paul wants us to say, uh oh, judgment seat of Christ, the righteous judge. Mm -hmm. Verse 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Now see, I want you to get this. He's in heaven now. He descends from heaven. He takes but but he, he takes us to a place in the air. He does the judgment seat. Then he takes us to God the Father. You gotta look at this. Look at that verse. Mm -hmm. He descends from heaven with a shout. Descends from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangel. Now, why would this archangel be there? 
Who is Michael the archangel? He's the warrior. He's the head of the armed forces. And why would why would Michael the archangel be there? Yeah, we're going to be somewhere where Satan and his angels are going to be. There's going to be a, a protection, like a secret service escort. You see that verse about the yeah, archangel? Yeah, I, this is something new. I yeah, we don't, we, we don't go over it enough. I, I'm, I'm going to go over this. Yeah, we're going a little over, but let's get this. Verse 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. So the archangel's with him. His and voice, with, what's his voice saying? Um, it doesn't say. No, it doesn't, does it? No. It says his voice. It just says a shout. He's, he's, sh he's he, you, can, I, can I tell you what I think it is, though? The Lord will descend with a shout. The, the Lord, Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Well, well, notice it's with the voice of the archangel, though. You see what it says? His, his voice is going to be the voice of the archangel. Well, the shout is. But let's read it. Here, watch this. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Period. No, that's a uh, comma. A uh, comma. Yeah, comma. You see the comma there? Yeah. With the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. So it could it could be the angels, the one who's shouting. And what they shout is a shout of victory come or a shout of war. Well, come forth, right? Remember with the trumpet in Israel, it was to gather the saints. Right. And how did, how did Israel know? Through the roar, the roaring of the trumpet, right? <laughs> right. I don't, that ain't the Vikings only, okay? I can't stand that Viking song. It's not a Viking's first name. My, my, my wife and daughter play this. They, my little girl does this Viking. Viking's horn. You know, the football team from Minnesota, they blow a horn when they get a first down. So my little girls, they mock me at home. And they blow that horn. You know, Brother Ryan, I heard you and uh, Ryan talk about this on a video one time. And you were saying how when they come from heaven, they're going to be breaking through all kinds of things and fighting angels on the way down? Now, especially in the second coming, right. Right, the war in heaven, mm -hmm. I'm saying here, because he's coming down through territory, mm -hmm. and those, Satan is the, the prince of the power of the air, his angels are out there, that, that's what I think is going on yeah. here. Yeah, it's a war. It's, a, it's some warfare. In other words, there's some, I'll, I'll explain it like this, in Daniel, in the book of Daniel chapter 10, Daniel starts to pray to God. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And he, God sends Abra, uh, Abra, Gabriel, the angel. Right. How long did it take Gabriel to get to Daniel? It took him a long time. Three weeks, 21 days. 21 days. And why 21 days? Because he was battling through there. In fact, if you read it, who, who comes to help him? Michael does. Michael the archangel comes to help Gabriel. Michael and his forces help Gabriel go through the heaven, the, from the heavens to the earth because he has to go through satanic territory, strongholds. Everybody get that? Read that in Daniel. So that's what I think is going on here. If the archangel's there, he has a purpose. And I do believe this was Michael. And with the trump of God. Now watch. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be what? Caught up together, together with them in the... Now see, see, no, notice where we go. In the clouds, see? To meet the Lord where? In the yeah. air. And so shall we ever be with so, so here's the point. The judgment seat of Christ, it takes place in the clouds and in the air. That's where the judgment seat takes place. Most people think that as what soon as we go up. What the clouds? You said sometimes the cloud means angels. It could be. Or it could just be clouds. Okay. <laughs> we don't know. How do you interpret it? Because the, the actual clouds that we see in the air... When the angels all are together, they look like that too. In the Bible, clouds are referred to as regular clouds. Like so, are the angels going to be there watching us? Being sure, judged? they are. They've been waiting for us. Well, that's what this means then. <laughs> yeah, they're going to be waiting for us. They've been they've been waiting for the body of Christ. But here's my point. He says the air. Remember, he didn't say at this point that the judgment seat, right at the rapture. He didn't say. Because he used the word heaven, the Lord descends from heaven, and we meet him in the clouds in the air, right? So that's something that's taking place not in the third heaven, is what I'm showing you. Does that make, make where's, sense? Where's the context of the, of the judgment seat? Well, that's, that's, that's where we go right after I know right. that's what you're saying, but where does it say that? I mean... Well, that's not the point of this verse. This passage, our question is, where does it say here in this passage? This is just to show that 
when people die, we're going to all be reunited. That's the purpose of this. Right. And that reunite, that, that re, re, reunification happens at the rapture. But what is the rapture taking us to is the point. What happens after the rapture? Okay, where is that found? As far as? The judgment seat of Christ. We're going to be judged. Oh, it's yeah. in Corinthians somewhere. Oh, yeah. Ro oh, it's, uh, uh, Romans? <laughs> you kept I, I, caught me off guard. Cause you Romans 14, 10, and, and 2 Corinthians 5, 10. We got to look okay, at that. All right, yeah. Okay. I, I was confused as your question. Yeah, I know. Judgment seat of Christ. Get 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, and Romans 14, 10. 2 Corinthians 5, verse yeah. 10. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, these are, these are the verses. By, by the way, these are the verses you just mentioned outright. But the, 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 the concept of judgment seat of Christ is mentioned all through Paul's epistles, but the, these are actual words, judgment seat of Christ. Look at Romans 14, verse 10. We're going to go to 2 Corinthians 5 also. Look at Romans 14, 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Romans 14. Romans 14, verse 10. What were you at, Doug? I'm in 2 Corinthians we, we're 5. Gonna go, we're going to go there next. Okay. This is the first time. Okay. Romans. Romans 14 and verse 10. Romans 14, 10. Yeah. Romans 14, verse 10. Okay. By the way, both of them is verse 10. 10 is associated with judgment in the scripture. Romans 14, verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before what? The judgment seat of Christ. Okay. I know we are, but I wanted to know how it ties in with the meeting in the air when you said that's where we're going to be. Yes. That I'm trying to put it together. Oh, I see what you're saying. Well, see, you know, I, okay, that, that makes sense. So, don't. Okay. Well, let's read verse 11, okay, okay. and 12. And then I'm gonna, I'll show you. Okay. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give what? An account, account of himself to God. Right. So it's like this, Dodie. So watch this. I know that's true. The rapture takes place. Right. The body of Christ, we meet. Okay, so the Lord Jesus, he comes down, right? The Lord. Right. He descends down from heaven. Here's heaven. I, I know what you're saying. You got I the angels? To see well, this is for everybody else, too. Where it brings it together. All right. So he comes down and we go up. And where do we meet? In the clouds, yeah. in the air. Yeah. What I'm saying is it's right there. The next thing that takes place is the judgment seat of Christ. That's the next thing on the list right there. Right. Okay, right. bam. But here's the point. I, I probably never really went into this. That's why we go to these verses. I, don't, I think, I, I can see if people think the moment we go up in a rapture, we're going straight to the heavens. I'm saying we're not. Not the third, not the third heaven. That's right. We're not going to the third heaven. Right. We're going to meet him in the clouds in the air. Right there. Then, according to 1 Thessalonians 3.13, after the judgment seat of Christ, he then takes us to God the Father. That's that yes, we had that just a little bit ago. Mm -hmm. Maybe that'll connect with that part. I, th I think that was it. Or it might be another one in 2 Thessalonians. Uh, let's get, go to 2 Corinthians 5. Let's look at that. Okay. Now, this is good. We're going over a lot of verses. Uh, second Thessalonians, I mean, what did I tell you? Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians 5. 5, 10. Yes, second Corinthians 5, 10. And, and I, I, I think the one, first Thessalonians 3, 13 was the one, and then there's another one in second Thessalonians. Look at, look at our second Corinthians 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the what? The judgment seat of Christ. We know that. That everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be what? Good or, bad. Good or bad. Verse number 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, that's the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest unto your, in your conscience. Now we're going to go over these verses in our study of 2 Thessalonians, uh, Corinthians in detail, but you see that terror of the Lord? Paul says he has to persuade some men with the terror of the Lord. He's saying you don't want to go to that judgment seat of Christ and have them deal with you. He calls them the avenger. He calls them the revenger. There's some revenge going to take place. So everybody got that. We, we, meet the, we meet the Lord in the air. He descends from heaven. 
after the judgment seat of Christ, then we go to God the Father. Chris, um, we got to come down here, but look at, I think the one you were thinking about, you said 2 Thessalonians, yeah. By the way, go back to 1 Thessalonians. We're in the, over there. Let me see if I can find that other word. First Thessalonians. Look at uh, chapter number five. Oh, I love this. Look at chapter number five. Um, verse eight. Start at verse eight. But let us, let us, but let us, who are of the day. Be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. By the way, he calls it the breastplate of faith and love. What does he call it over in Ephesians 6? The breastplate of what? What, what verse? Uh, chapter 5, verse 8. Paul calls the breastplate the breastplate of faith and love in chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians. What does he call the breastplate in Ephesians chapter 6? Does anybody know? Truth and righteousness? No, the breastplate of righteousness. You close. So. If the Apostle Paul, let's compare verse to verse. If the Apostle Paul writes that it's the breastplate of faith and love here, but in Ephesians he says it's the breastplate of righteousness, what does that tell us? Faith and love equals righteousness, and righteousness is faith and love. How do you know that you're going to receive a crown of righteousness? If you have faith in the Lord Jesus and love to all his saints. That's how you're going to do it. Verse 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the what of salvation? The hope of salvation for, verse 9, for God, here's one of your verses, Dodie, for God has not appointed us to what? Wrath. But to obtain salvation, how? By our Lord Jesus Christ. Guess what? That rapture is going to get us out before the wrath. That's right. Let's look at one more in chapter number 5. Look at verse 23. Oh, this is a good way to end. Look at this. Verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. Now that's not H-O-L-Y. That means whole, like whole foods. Food, whole, full, right? Yeah. And I pray God, your whole what? Spirit, soul, soul and what? You know what? There are people who call, think that we are some type of um, being, uh, what they call it, they think that we're just a, a, a spirit, a body and a spirit. And that's crazy. Because right there, he says what? Your whole spirit. So we are a soul that possesses a spirit and, and, and dwells in a body. Spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless until the what? Coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But look, read verse 24 as we end. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will, will do it. it. God's will Amen. is to do it. Amen. And if we allow him to do it through the it. doctrine, I love it. it's going to work, right? All right, next time, in, uh, next Wednesday, I'm going to do, uh, uh, Wednesday or Thursday, depending on what, what, what I got on the I'm going to do a Facebook live at home. But in two weeks, so when do we meet again? <gasps> the third. No, no, no. It's only two. How, many, how many days in this month? 28. So it is the 28th. Oh, the last, all right, we're going to meet on the 28th, and we're going to look at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, not for the body of Christ, but for the nation of Israel. We're going to okay. see some Old Testament verses, we're going to see 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, and yeah, the second coming. The Lord is coming for us. I end each of my uh, studies, my Facebook lives, I say, we're one day closer to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you can rejoice in that. And I want y'all to know, every day I wake up, I do two things. I thank God for his marvelous grace that I woke up and I got my, I blessed. But I pray that the Lord come back. And I pray hard. I just, I want him to come back so bad. Because I know all the hurting saints that I hear from. And I just want all of us to be together. I don't want any of this schisms. And you know schism in the body of Christ? Yes, I do. And I hate it. Mm -hmm. And since 2013, when my brother back in, uh, Grace School of the Bible kicked me out for uh, rejecting me because the stand for the truth of the word. It's been on my heart. I hate I hate that that stuff is out there like that. Because when the rapture happens, we, all that stuff, we're not going to have that. Our no flesh in it involved, you know? 
I've been thinking, so I want the Lord to come. And there's a lot of saints are hurting who don't have a church to attend. So I'm praying every day the Lord to come. I know he gets tired of me doing that. No, he doesn't. No, he, he actually wants me to do that. He blesses you because I see you to want to. Yeah. But I'm ready for us to go be with the Lord. I'm willing to give away. I told Craig, I'll give some of what I built up over the years to Craig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want the Lord to come. And then when I when I read ver these verses that I share with you, I'm really, I'm really uh, looking for the Lord to return and take us home. So he's gonna bring, he's gonna take us home. Well, he eventually we're gonna go to judgment seat of Christ, meet the Lord in the air in the cloud, judgment seat of Christ, then we're gonna see God our Father. Mm -hmm. And nobody is gonna have any um Sins. He's going to deal with all our sins. He's going to deal with all of our blameless. Uh, yeah, he's going, we're going to be blameless. Mm -hmm. He's going to burn off all the dross off of all of us. Mm -hmm. And when we all go to the Father, then shall every man have praise of God, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time tonight. We thank you for the blessing of your Holy Word through your Holy Son, the Lord Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. We thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are here tonight, those who follow by way of the Internet. Uh, we just appreciate uh, all the blessings you give us in Christ. But Father, our hearts do desire for the return of your Son, the Lord Jesus. We, we, we look forward to meeting him in the air. May this be the year, Lord. Amen. May this be the year. Amen. But if not, we trust your infinite wisdom, your holiness. And we know that every day that you delay that, that he tears, it's a day in your grace. glorious wisdom to, 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 to get your grace out uh, another day. Yes. And we're thankful for that. Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks and praise for all this in Christ's name. Amen.